Okay, everybody, welcome back to another week of Striper Migration Reports from On the Water. My name is Matt Hefner. I'm the assistant editor here at On the Water magazine. Um, we're going to jump right into our guests this week after a quick recap, as usual. So last week, we were joined by guest Joe Albanese, who is president of the Hudson River Fishermen's Association, and Kevin Ryan, who is the owner of Tog Candy Jigs. He's also an avid kayak fisherman out of Staten Island. Um, since then, New York striped bass season has officially opened as of this past Monday, Monday the 15th. And last week with Joe and Kevin, we focused heavily on Hudson River stripers, their patterns, such as when they spawn and when they exit the Hudson, um, and some of those early season techniques for jigging soft plastics and flutter spoons outside of New York Harbor. This week, we've got our eyes on some fresh migratory stripers that have just arrived on the oceanfront beaches in Rhode Island, which are likely those same fish that squeaked through the East River in Long Island Sound two weeks ago or so. And on a separate note, the first migratory stripers have just reached Martha's Vineyard. I got word of that moments ago from one of our guests this week, um, who's going to talk a little bit more about that in depth. So before we head north with the fresh migratory schoolies, we're going to check in on the status of the migration in the western Long Island Sound. All right, everybody. So our first guest this week is a New York State DEC licensed kayak fishing guide. He's our Western Long Island and New York City fishing report author at On the Water, and he also happens to be my coworker. Please welcome Nick Cancelier. Nick, what's going on? What's going on, Matt? Happy to be here. Awesome, man. Well, uh, and so we know that you had a, a pretty solid second half of March and even a couple of productive outings earlier this month. Um, but what does striper fishing look like right now on the Western North Shore of Long Island where you are? Yeah, man, it's it's been tough. It's uh, it's nothing like it was kind of like last week. And, and, you know, March, we had these really big holdover fish that were biting. Um, but yeah, they, they, they've been stacked up in the bays, but just getting them to bite has been another story. And uh, the class of fish is definitely a little smaller. You know, it's been more like schoolies up to slot size. Occasionally, you'll see that over slot fish show up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in terms of, of how the bite spin, it's it's just been a little tough this week. I think, you know, you look at last week, there were there were more peak tides, like really high tides, really low tides. Yeah. Plus you had the um the moon and whatnot. Um so yeah, it's just just a tougher week this week. But the you know, good thing is, and what me and my buddies were telling each other was it can only get better from here, right? Exactly, exactly. And you and I were just kind of touching on it uh, before we jumped on this call, but the full moon's on the way. So that you guys have that working in your favor too. And I mean, uh, you know, it's probably a lot of these fish running up the Hudson and that might have something might have something to do with the lack of, uh, you know, a good bite this week. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it also, it seems like the fish that were staged up in the Western sound have since moved on. Um, I know my buddy, Sean, who lives out in Smithtown, Stony Brook area is getting on them pretty good this week. Um, we've even heard of some migratory fish in Connecticut and, uh, in Eastern Connecticut, I should say, and Rhode Island as of like yesterday. And literally as of moments ago, there's some migratory fish off of the South side of Martha's vineyard. Um, which we're going to get into later. But when do you expect that next wave of migrators to come through the Western Sound? Man, I'm hoping next week. I mean, you know, when I go to the bays and whatnot, I'm not really seeing the amount of bait that I was seeing this time last year. You know, like you look at some places on the North Shore, you had peanut bunker just end to end. There would be like right. daytime blitzes. You'd see birds working. I'm not really seeing that now. So, you know, when that bait moves in and I'm hoping, you know, that the bass will be in with it, whether the bass come first or the bait come first, I don't know. Um, but like you said, you know, we got a full moon coming up, um, you know, stronger tides and whatnot. So, I mean, hopefully in the next week or two, things will really pick up uh, because, you know, like I said, it can only get better, right? Yeah, and it's and the, it's funny you mentioned the bunker presence, and it, we we know how important that is from talking to the guys last week, Kevin Ryan and uh, oh, yeah. Joe Albanese in the Hudson. But I, I've actually heard of a lot of bunker already in Rhode Island. Um, I've got a couple guys that have been fishing out that way that just called me actually earlier today and said there's ton of full size adult bunker up there. So I wonder if that's like these early season waves of bunker are you know they they kind of displace themselves every year. We've seen different concentrations. Like last year was the Western Sound. The year before that, in the spring, um, as stripers were finishing the migration up the coast, it was Plymouth. There was just bunker everywhere, Plymouth, Massachusetts. So yeah. uh, there's something to be said about those early, we, you know, early season waves of bunker and, and where they are that really turns on the fishing. Oh, yeah, man. And I mean, you look at last year versus like, you know, two years ago where, you know, these bunker would come flood the bays and stay there all summer. But last year, it really didn't work like that. You know, like by June, July, they were kind of like gone. Like nobody yeah. really knew where they went. You had, you know, you had peanut bunker, you had spearing, you had small bait, but you didn't really have these adult bunker around. And, you know, it didn't hurt the bite too much. There was a good light tackle bite. Uh, there were plenty of blues around, but 
you know, it's just, it's weird not seeing these adult bunkers. So that's something I'm looking for this year is hopefully for them to come back and stick around, you know, and, and be able to live line some bunker for some huge stripers again. For sure. Yeah. Well, we know there's tons I, of bunker I, in, in Jamaica Bay and in Raritan Bay yeah. right now. Yeah, Jay, they, they always get the bunker. They're, they're, they're lucky down there with that. Um, yeah. But yeah, last, last year I, I I dialed in my uh, my circle hook and like live lining setup, and I, I think I only used it like twice. So. Oh yeah, you'll have to you have to get some more reps in this year. It's it's a lot. Yeah. Of fun. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so I mean, we mentioned just the amount of bunker in like Raritan and and Jamaica Bay's right now, and we know that. You know, it's common to see fish will trickle out of the Hudson and Raritan rivers uh, very early on in the spring to kind of feed on some of those bunker that are year round residents. So do you think it's possible that a lot of these larger fish that have staged in the Western Sound throughout March are now heading back into the Hudson to spawn before beginning their migration? Yeah, I mean, it, it, that that makes sense to me. You know, it's like I, I I have buddies that, you know, fish the Hudson that I need to reach out to and see like, you know, you guys catching bigger fish all of a sudden because... Yeah, I mean, they're, they're certainly not in the places that they were, you know, early March. It seems like the big fish really kind of moved out. Right. And, and and you know what, we forget, it's easy to forget that, you know, those fish don't have to run back all the way down the East River. They have the Harlem River right there that can, is an easy connection yeah. um, to right into the middle of the Hudson around the George Washington Bridge. So that's, that's totally possible. Um, and and yeah. I'd be interested to know if like through tagging studies, if people have ever found that, you know, that some of those Western Sound fish go back into the river. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be really cool to see. You know, yeah, with all the to, stuff to see with the gray fish tags, it'd be be really cool to see like some of the returns and whatnot. Yeah, gray fish and uh, the one Joe Albanese was talking about last week, the Littoral Society. It sounds like they yeah. tag a lot of Hudson stripers. So I'll have to follow up with him on that and kind of ask him that question because that sounds like it'd be interesting to know. Just uh, you know, what do our resident stripers do? Like, what are their patterns? Um, yeah. But you know, we're heading into the back nine of April already, which which seems crazy. But based on your past seasons in the Western Sound, what do you think will change in this next week in terms of the forage base and the abundance and class of fish? Well, I think more bait's going to come in. I think bigger fish are going to come in. We're going to start seeing actual migratory fish with those sea lice. You know, that's something I've been looking out for and haven't really yeah. been seeing. It's been a lot of clean fish. You know, last Tuesday, I got my first kayak fish. It was a beauty, like 30 inch and it was totally clean. No sea lice, nothing. Um, but yeah, I mean, more bait coming in, bigger, bigger size fish. Um, you know, uh, yeah, pretty much just bait and bigger fish. That's that's kind of what, what what marks like the end of April for me, right? Just more bait, bigger fish. Do you expect to see like a lot more spearing in the back bays? Like I know up here, a herring are a really important part of those spring run of stripers and squid out in the rips and stuff, but more so when they first show up like they are right now, you get a lot of fish keyed in on herring in the rivers. So like, what is that key forage for you guys on the North shore? Is it spearing or like last year it was peanut bunker? Last year it was peanut bunker. Yeah. And then usually, I mean, by June it's, it's adult bunker, but last yeah. year it wasn't that it was, it was peanut bunker. So I, it's, it's kind of thrown me for a loop. It's been a really weird season. I think I also got spoiled by last year. Yeah. You know, I had a really good opening week. I mean, opening day was on a Saturday. So I feel like I was doing a lot more fishing like when I wanted to, as opposed yeah. to when I was able to, um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the North Shore, yeah, mostly kind of like spearing, you know, I think that's kind of been the name of the game this year. So that's what I, I think we're going to be seeing, you know, if the bunker don't show up, knock on wood. But um, yeah, I think more spearing and, and um, you know, hopefully more of those adult bunker. And so last thing I want to ask you is because it, sometimes it can be really tip, uh, difficult for guys on kayaks to dial in on a, you know, striper on spearing kind of bite. So what do you favor throwing from the kayak when stripers are keyed in on those spearing? On spearing, definitely uh, thin, soft plastics. Uh, probably one of my favorite. Uh, I wish I had one with me right now to hold up, but uh, a, a Kytec um, swing impact, the, uh, the fat ones with the ribs, yep. uh, anywhere from like four to five inches. It's a great great lore. You know, you can cast it, just retrieve it. You can troll it behind the kayak on the way to a spot. Um, it just works great. Um, something that I've been kind of using religiously right now has just been the Z-Man diesel minnows. Um, oh, it's a bit of a chunkier profile, you know, it doesn't quite fit that spearing profile, but I mean, it usually works well all the same. Um, and I like them because they hold up the blues. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, we know you guys got a good run of blues in the Western sound too last year. Oh, man. Bunker around. So yeah, definitely oh, need yeah. those durable soft plastics. Nick, well, I, I really appreciate you jumping on, man. Um, we uh, we got to get out fishing at some point again this spring. I'll be down there. I was talking to Kevin Ryan about it, to jumping on the kayak in a couple of weeks. So end of April, maybe we can uh, work something out and get out on the axe. Yeah, buddy. You can stay in my guest bedroom. All right, man. Sounds good. Looking forward to it.
enjoy the rest All of right, the uh, migration this week and uh we'll be in touch as the full moon comes around sounds good man all right thanks a lot nick all right take it easy see ya all right good stuff from nick down on long island hopefully those full moon tides around april 23rd will push some fresh fish into western long island sound but moving up the striper coast a bit our next guest is a friend of on the waters and he routinely seems to be the one who breaks the ice on the spring migration catching those first migratory stripers of the year in massachusetts please welcome stavros viglas uh stavros how's it going man hey matt thank you so much for having me i'm looking forward to this all year uh, you know, i know got the first, the first striper today yeah that's, so that's what we wanted to get into we were going to say uh, i was going to ask you like the first migratory stripers of the year just pulled up in the vineyard surf as of tonight or today which is wednesday at the time of this recording um so what are you throwing at them and what signs are you looking for along the beach that might be indicative of fish so early on in the season? Well, so every year I try, try to aim for April 12th through the, you know, like I start at April 12th. Yeah. So, cause I know that they start to open the ponds and I know that's something I look for when they open, you know, West Tisbury Grey Pond or Egertown Grey Pond. But um, so that's one of the signs I'm looking for. But I'm also throwing these ounce and a half to two ounce coops, coop ties these. And I put the little bucktail on the back. That's uh, the coops bait and tackle on the vineyard. Yep. Yep. And I also put the um, uh, coops tells these to the uh, back cow jig strip. Yep. Yeah, those are great. Great addition to a bucktail. So why do they open? I mean, why is the fishing like pick up so much when they uh, when they open up those salt ponds? Uh, I think all the baits getting ready to flood out. Mm -hmm. There's a huge tidal flow, and the uh, the herring and everything else. No, they're sitting out there waiting to come in. Yeah, so you can the the gannets are on them, the seagulls, the turn everything's on the bait. As soon as they open that pond, baits coming out fish are coming in it's crazy how they know i mean it's similar to the way i know it i know that certain date that yeah. their fish are going to be here right and those fish on a certain date there's going to be bait coming out so. exactly well and so you mentioned you know that they opened one of the salt ponds a little earlier this year so the herring really had a chance yeah. to you know scoot in there and i think the herring have been around cape for a couple of weeks now so yeah so the herring have been around the cape i mean i grew up in mashpee and i my dad and I used to go check out the the Mashpee herring run all the time. Yeah, one of my favorite things to do, and they they've been in there for a few weeks prior to today, and um, I've also been monitoring the uh, Wampanoag water treatment plant up island. Mm -hmm. They have a, a a a a camera where you can look and see what's coming and going. So for us islanders, we tend to check that and see what's going on that's usually one of the signs we look for you know what's coming and going you start to see the glass eels you start to see the um the silver sides the herring coming and going the holdovers coming out exploring the you know the the warm water for the first yeah. time of the year and then you see the fresh fish coming in and that's when you know it's time to hit the beach yeah well it sounded like this morning when you kind of went down to when you went down to the beach or or maybe i guess it was your lunch break rather but when you got down there that you saw fish just exploding within feet of the shoreline yeah so all the fish i've caught are right at your feet you literally do not most people are flinging it out there you want to cast far enough that your jig or paddle tail will drop down and be right where it curves up you want it right there because they're gonna bite right there like you're yeah. gonna think you're hooked on a rock or you're feeling little tap tap taps that might you're like oh that's sand and that could be a fish 90 percent time that's a fish yeah so there's so not much you can really snag on nope so literally you got this big hump goes down and they are right there they're right at your feet yeah, they're hanging in the trough right on the beach lip, just scooping up any bait. It, it's crazy because you're you'll be, and then all of a sudden you're, you you'll think it's you know bump from the maybe like a little rock at the shore's edge, but nope, you get a bass. Well, like like I said, I'm gonna try to get out there with you this weekend. Hopefully on Saturday we can uh, get into some fish in the surf. That'd be awesome. 
Definitely. So this has been the trick. Yeah. When it's a calm day, you throw this 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 guy. Oh yeah, good. What is that? Storm shad. Yep, storm shad. I think this is one ounce. Very yeah. It's it's not the smallest, but it's the next step up. Right. This one's already seen some action today. You can tell. There you go. Next thing I throw is this guy, the uh, savage. This is an ounce, ounce and a half, I think. That's a great spearing imitation, silver side right there. This is, this is great. So yeah. easy to throw, easy retrieve, straight retrieve. As long as the paddle tail is working, you're fine. You know, it doesn't catch a lot of weeds. It doesn't, it doesn't, the, the, the head stays intact. But my favorite, so if you guys are walking out to the ponds, especially fishing an opening, and you guys are casting on the inside and then decide to go to the outside, take one of these 360 search baits. They have a rattle head. These things are amazing. Yeah, the Storm 360 GT. Yep. So yeah. they this is this is their new body. But that rattle head, this is what you're looking for. They really pick up on that. I think this is a, a, a key thing. Right, because, I mean, it helps them track that bait. I mean, obviously, they use the lateral line, but in their, like, roiled surf and stuff like that, when the pond's open and the water's all flowing out, the paddle tail is not only going to be amplified, but they can kind of track it a little easier with that rattle. Exactly. Well, the, yeah. This rattle is pretty good, too. Yeah, it's pretty um, solid. I like fishing, fishing with those things. But also, my go-to for holdovers... This is what I'm talking about. Not necessarily in this color, but this exact size I would get. What is this? This is uh, it's about a quarter ounce or something. Yeah, four and a half, uh, one quarter ounce. Yep. Yeah, four and a half inch, quarter ounce. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. Yeah, yep. shallow backwaters. That's perfect. Yeah. So speaking of the shallow backwaters, um, you know, the past several years, like you mentioned, you've been catching those first migratory bass in the surf almost routinely on or by april 15th um, i think you mentioned april 12th before but once those initial that initial wave of schoolies kind of moves on how does your approach to striper fishing change that's a great question so um i was just talking to my buddy um that i saw on the beach today which is something i look forward to this time of year the bass show up you start to see friends you haven't seen in so long <laughs> yeah it's great so for example Walked out there today, saw my buddy Andy. He caught his first striper. It was great. I was telling him, I said, once everything really heats up on the beach, you know, everyone's out there, you're catching pretty much on anything. That's yeah. when I switch to the ponds. Okay. That's when I go to top that's when I go to top water. Cause you know, you once the beach heats up, that means the pond's heating up. And then you got to keep an eye on that worm hatch. Oh, yeah. Once that worm hatch happens, that's when it's amazing for the fly, for the poppers. So does, so, does that tend to happen for you in like the last week of April or for more like first week of May usually, right? So you got to keep an eye on the moon. Some other factors are a lot, you know, just it depends on when the bass show up. I usually give it a couple weeks, mm. like a week or two, and then I'll start checking the ponds. Then once you see all the seagulls and the gulls and the pond, you know it's the, the warm match is happening. And, and you still have those herring uh, moving in and out as well. Yeah. Yep. The herring come in pretty early. Um, some of the herring have already stopped moving in to a couple of the ponds. Okay. Some of the guys, especially Doug from Dick's Bait and Tackle, will tell you that the herring got annihilated by the cormorants inside of the OB Lagoon. Yeah, they came out early. The cormorants staged up. There was thousands of them in there. Oh my god! Yeah, they're they're kind of a nuisance. But on the beaches, sometimes they are a big help. You know, indicating where there's bait fish and stuff. Exactly. I, I mean, as the stripers continue to to move in, you know, we're obviously going to start to see some of those bigger fish soon. Hopefully, the ones from the Chesapeake will start to reach us. But you know, Buzzards Bay and the Elizabeth Islands, as you know, tend to be kind of a hotbed for those big bass when they do make it up here. So looking ahead, when do you think that those fish, uh, and I guess based on your past years of experience, when do you think that those kind of larger, like 40-inch Chesapeake fish will start to reach us? First week of May, if um, us vineyard guys will start heading up through Woods Hole, up to uh, Budgers Bay, or up through the Elizabeth. Yeah. Because the, the the bunker will stage up, and that's that's when everything really kicks off. 
Yeah. And I know there's already a bunch of bunker actually in, uh, in Rhode Island. I've got some buddies who have been, you know, seeing just massive schools of them out in Western Rhode Island. So there's definitely some fish moving in that way as well. So last year it was pretty crazy. I don't, I'm not sure what caused it, but we had an extreme amount of bait come down in the inside of no man's. Mm -hmm. So there was tons of fish that we normally don't see large bass tuna that we were getting into. I hope that continues this year because we didn't have to go up through Buzzers Bay or, or through Woods Hole or Elizabeth. We right. were seeing really big fish. I wonder if that's got something to do with the windmills pushing the bait in or or yeah. what. But it'd be interesting to to know if that has any impact on their kind of like migratory track when they're, you know, just off the coast like that. Well, we had we had tuna and inside no man's in June. Yeah. We had 30, 40 pounders inside no man's in June, all in the same area, kind of, if you know where to look. And then just the amount of bait flowing between the Elizabeths and the island. We had whales, we had turtles. It was incredible. It's unbelievable. It's a lot to look forward to this coming season, man. Definitely. The last question I want to leave people with is if you could give one piece of striper fishing advice to Cape Codders and Islanders, and I guess anybody fishing the south coast of Massachusetts over the next week, what would it be? So my advice for everybody would be, if you're trying to go catch a fish today, grab a jig, go down to the beach, find a deep spot with water flowing. That's what you're looking for. An outflow, you want to hit that edge, put a jig on or a storm shad, a paddle tail, in a couple of weeks, you're going to be wanting the inside of the estuaries. But for now, you want to hit the beach, bounce it off the bottom. Uh, I would use a 20 pound leader. Yeah. Nothing heavier than that because they can see everything. But also do a very light tactical angler clip. This one's a 50 pound to 25. That's what I would use. Nothing bigger than that because it fits all these small jigs that I use. The paddle tails are very easy to use because you straight reel. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do any jigging. That's great. Storm Shad, one of my favorites again. When you do get to the estuaries, the jumping minnow, that's what you got to use or any sort of this is one that actually my, is my favorite. This is the Savage Mud Minnow. This one's great because it comes with a little teaser on the back. It's weighted. Yep. It's got the rattle. This one catches. I would also recommend replacing your hooks with either a, a single hook, non-barbed, or um, a stronger VMC, but just pinch the barbs. And so you mentioned um, real quick uh, that you want moving water, especially when you're working a jig. Now, are you looking for an outgoing tide primarily because it's got that warmer water moving through or, or does it really matter right now? So if you're looking at the beach, for us, we have the opening. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes the tide will flow one way or the other way. So you kind of have to pick and choose, you know, which way. But you don't want to be right in it because it's too strong. Right. So you kind of want to go you know, two, 200, 300 feet away mm -hmm. where it's a little bit less current. Cause you got to keep them like stripers just want to get fat and they want to eat as much as possible doing as less as possible. Exactly. So you got to keep that in mind. Like they just want to get fat and do nothing. <laughs> so you cast that up current, let it drag down. You'll kind of see like in the beach where the, waves crash and they are nasty you don't want to be in there you want to be just where everything kind of settles down mm -hmm. but they're also really close so you want to don't want to cast it out too far so that it's swinging way away you want to plan your cast cast it out and say i want my, my lure say here's the here's the uh like where my feet would be or the surf you want to cast out here you want your lure to come and be right here at this edge. And you're going to think that that's really too close, but that's a fish. Same thing for holdovers on the inside. You go on the inside, you look for the dark water, weigh it out, you cast the edges, work the edges. 
and then when you move into the to to the tidal ponds, you always want to kind of pick that that edge where there's some water moving and you can see the water moving too it's it's, it's not hard to find so i was i was walking back from kwan the other day i know these guys because i was fishing on the beach and all these guys were showing up and fishing the inside of the pond so I'm like it's five o'clock you know it's kind of too early for a holdover I'm like, what are they doing but these guys are catching fish but then more people show up so that, they all knew like kind of where to go yeah, but they all started fishing the inside. They found this point as the opening came in, and they were all so they were standing here, and the point was coming around like this. They were all casting into it, and they were hooking up. But it was so funny to watch them all come and stage up together. Yeah, right. I don't, I'm not sure if they knew each other or not, but it, but it is always nice this time of year to see everybody. That's what I look forward to. Absolutely. Wow, you, you, people you haven't seen in so long. Yeah, it's those fishing friends that you see, you know, only a couple times a year when you bump into each other down on the beach and stuff. Oh, yeah. Plus, everyone knows the white truck. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, you get you get a reputation down there. But um, Stavros, uh, that was awesome. That was some great parting advice, you know, to let people, you know, um, to let people know that, you know, you don't always have to cast super far. Sometimes that strike zone's right in front of you. All you really need is some moving water and uh, the right types of lures. Yeah, guys, keep in mind, an ounce and a half to an ounce, you don't have to cast far. They're going to be right in front of you. Thanks again for joining, man. It was great having you, and look forward to seeing you on Saturday. Hey, man, thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Good to see you as always. To everybody watching, thank you so much. Happy 2024. Let's yeah. get it. This is great. I'm so happy the season has started. On the Water Magazine, thank you so much. I love seeing you guys and everybody, um, you know, at the shows. And thank you for your support, always. I love you guys. I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. Thanks a lot. We'll talk to you. Well, everybody, with New York season underway, migratory bass on the vineyard, and warm weather and a full moon ahead, the striper migration is off and running. To our New Englanders, look to the salt ponds, the back bays, and estuaries for some of those early season migrators over the next week. And like Nick and Stavros said, with those schoolies around and plenty of small bait like silver sides, think smaller presentations to dial in a bite. That's all the time we have this week. Thanks again to our guests, Nick Cancelier and Stavros Vigilis. And don't forget that there are only two weeks left before the start of Striper Cup. It's on the water's 20 week catch and release striper fishing tournament. And there are loads of opportunities to win weekly prizes from Yeti, Penn, Bubba, and Costa just for catching striped bass and photographing them. Check it out at stripercup.com. Thanks for watching and don't forget to tune in next week for another Striper Migration Report from On the Water.